Archeo Death. Death and Memory, Past and Present, with Professor Howard Williams. I'm going to start my live properly on the hour, but I'm going to, I'm going to read from you, to you from a bit of uh, Tolkien's translation of the epic Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf to get you in the mood, and while people amass their questions and issues for me. So we'll uh, see how we get on. So this is a old translation, but has recently been published of J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, uh, translation of the 10th century, or 9th, 8th, 10th century poem Beowulf, which obviously dates back as an oral tradition to the 7th century. And I thought this would be a good way of kick-starting where we're at, because it deal, deals with some material culture from the early Middle Ages. Um, let's see where we are. Right, so we have, um, now the wo this is from the section where the dragon has been, sl has been slain by Beowulf and Wiglaf, or Wistan as he's called in this version. Then I heard the speedily the son of Wistan, when these words were spoken, did hearken to his wounded lord in combat stricken, striding in his net-like mail, his corslet for battle woven under the barrow's vault. This is from inside the, the burial mound where the dragon had been guarding the treasure. Then passing by the seat, that young knight, proud-hearted, filled with the joy of victory, beheld a host of hoarded jewels, gold glistening that lay upon the ground, marvellous things upon the wall, the very lair of that old serpent in the dim light flying and ewers standing there, vessels of men of bygone days, reft of those who cared for them, their fair adornment crumbling. There were many a helm, old and rusted, a multitude of twisted armlets in strange devices twinned. Treasure, gold hidden in the earth, easily may overtake the heart of any of the race of men. Let him beware who will. There too he saw a banner hanging all wrought in gold, high above the hoard, the chiefest of all marvellous things, of handicraft, woven by the skill of fingers. Therefrom a radiance issued, that he might plain perceive that space beneath the earth and all the precious things survey. Of the serpent there was naught to see, nay, the sword had taken him. Then, as I have heard, within that mound, the hoard, the ancient work of giants, did one man plunder, laid in his bo bosom with dish and goblet at his own sweet will. The banner, too, he seized, of standards the most shining fair. The broad sword of his age lord, iron was its edge, had brought to ruin him that in his sway these precious things had kept long while, the terror of his flame wielding hot before the horde, swirling fiercely in the midmost night, until he died a bitter death. So that's the description of the dragon's horde within the burial mound. Uh, and this is uh, leading us up to line 2340 of the poem Beowulf. Then we have a section which explains what happens next. In haste was the messenger, eager to return, urged by the precious spoils. Anx anxiety pierced his uplifted heart to know whether he should yet live, yet living, find the prince of the, the wind-loving people upon that level place where he had erstwhile left him, his valour ebbing. So, in other words, Beowulf dying outside while Wiglaf explores the inside of the chamber. Now bearing these precious things, he found that prince renowned, his lord, bleeding nigh to his life's end. Once more he began to sprinkle him with water, until speech like a sharp pang burst from the prison of his breast. Thus spake the age warrior king in anguish, looking upon the gold. So Wiglaf has brought the gold out to Beowulf, who's dying from the wounds of the dragon, and he gets to see some of the gold before he dies. T 
To the master of all, the glorious King and everlasting Lord, I speak now my words of thanks for those fair things that I here gaze upon, for that I have been suffered ere my death's hour such wealth to gather for my people. Now that I have for the hoard of precious things bartered the span of time, mine old life, do ye henceforth furnish the people's needs. No longer may I here remain. Bid ye men renowned in war to make a mound for me, plain to see when the pyre is done upon a headland out to sea. It shall tower on the high above Ross Ness, a memorial to my folk that voyagers upon the sea shall hereafter name it Beowulf's Barrow. Even they who speed from afar, afar their ships over the shadows of the deeps. So Beowulf is saying, build me a barrow on the headland. You know, cremate me and build me a barrow on the headland um, to, so that I can be remembered from afar, so people can rem remember my name. So th this is a, a, an auto-funeral request. So to Beowulf is actually speaking his wishes in his dying breaths. Of the most important thing is how he's remembered, how his monument is constructed. From his neck, that prince of valiant heart undid a gold circlet and gave it to his knight, young wielder of the spear and his helm, gleaming with gold, his corslet and a ring, bidding him use them well. And Beowulf said, Thou art the end, the latest of our house of Wigman's line. All hath fate swept away my, of my kingsfolk to their appointed doom. Good men of valour, I must follow them. I must, I must go with my ancestors, which is, this is Tolkien, obviously. So you can, you can almost hear, uh, but, um, you can almost hear uh, Theoden saying those same lines, you know, is in, in, um, you know, sort of similar line, I must join my ancestors, I must go with, with them. It's a very, you know, this is, this, is of, this is very archaic, and Tolkien's writing in a very medievalist style here, but it's an interesting translation nonetheless. That was the light, latest word that issued from that aged heart and breast, ere he betook him to the pyre and the hot surge of warring flames. From his bosom did the soul depart to seek the judgment of the last. Seek the judgment of the just, sorry. I don't know what I said. Then grievous was the lot of that man, little tried in years, seeing upon the earth that a most beloved of men at his life's end suffering miserably, his slayer too lay dead, the dire dragon of the cave bereft of life, whom torment had oppressed. Those hoarded rings no longer might the rule, might he rule, that serpent crooked coiling. Nay, blades of iron had seized him, hard forged by hammers, notched in war, but he who had winged afar by wounds was stilled, fallen upon the ground beside his treasure house. In other words, the dragon's dead right by Beowulf. So you've got the two corpses juxtaposed by the, by the poet. Never more in his disport did he wander through the air at midmost night, nor proud in the possession of fair things reveal his form to men but was cast upon the earth by the hand and the deed of that leader of the host. In sooth, few among men that possessed great valour in that land, as I have heard, had luck therein, when daring though he were in every deed, he hurled him against the blast of that unvenomed foe, or troubled with his hand his hall of rings, if he therein had found the guardian dwelling watchful in his mound. Even by Beowulf was his portion of those kingly treasures paid for with his, his death. Both now had journeyed to the end of passing life. Well, Tolkien really makes it as, as pompous as possible in this translation. It's not an easy read, but I think you get that sort of, you get the vibe. That's, 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 so that's Beowulf's death with the hoard that he's won through his slaying. Uh, you know juxtaposed you know against him the corpse of the dragon and i want to just quickly jump to another later that leads us up to uh line 2391 of the anglo-saxon poem and if we if we jump to the end this you get another important section that explains what happens you know beowulf was asked his body to 
be cremated and a barrow to be built. And then we get at the very end of the poem, this section which describes it. Um, so for him, then the Geetish lords a pyre prepared upon the earth, not small, with helmets o'erhung and shields of war and corslets shining, as his prayer had been. Now laid they amidmost their glorious king, mighty men lamenting their lord beloved. Then upon the hill warriors began the mightiest of funeral fires to waken, wood smoke mounted black above the burning, a roaring flame ringed with weeping, till the swirling wind sank quiet and the body's bone house was crumbled in the blazing pyre. Unhappy in heart, they mourned their misery and their liege lord slain. There too, a lamentable lay, many a geetish maiden, with braided tresses for Beowulf made, singing in sorrow, oft repeating that days of evil she sorely feared, many a slaying, cruel and te terror armed, ruined, ruin and thraldom's bond. The smoke faded in the sky, then the lord of the wind loving people upon a seaward slope a tomb wrought that was high and broad. To voyages on the waves, clear seen afar, and in ten days they build a memorial to the brave in war, encompassing with a wall what the fires had left. In other words, they built a wall around the pyre, and a monument was built over it in ten days, in such most splendid wise as men of chief wisdom could contrive. In that mound they laid armlets and jewels, and all such ornaments as erstwhile daring-hearted men had taken from the hoard, abandoning the treasure of mighty men to earth to keep, gold to the ground where yet it dwells, as profitless to men as it proved of old. Then around the tomb rode warriors valiant, sons of princes, twelve men in all, who would their woe bewail, their king's lament, a dirge upraising, that man praising, honouring his prowess and his mighty deeds, is worth esteeming, even as it, as is meet that a man should his lord beloved in words extol his heart cherish when forth he must from the raiment of flesh be taken far away. Whew. Thus bemourned the Geetish folk, their master's fall, comrades of his hearth, crying that he was ever the king of the earth, of men most generous and to men most gracious, to his people most tender and for praise most eager. Well, that's that's the Tolkien version, which is as newly published, but actually incredibly archaic and medievalist. And um, just to get you in the mood for a bit of archaeology from the early Middle Ages, because I want to talk about treasure, and I want to talk about the artefacts um, that are behind this Christian era story of a pagan funeral, uh, a, a, a dragon guarding a treasure hoard, slain but killing the hero and then the body of Beowulf disposed of um, with great ceremony by the Geetish people afterwards. And I, I'm doing this little live really just to say I've got to 15,000, I'm almost at 15.5,000 followers so that's a great nice achievement and it's nice to have some following. I, I try to have some integrity in what I produce on here. I'm not uh, uh, chasing particular clout, although a lot of my followers came to me most recently because I disagreed with a very popular creator on a particular issue about the Vikings. But that, that aside, I, I want to basically produce and share some archaeological and historical knowledge from my expertise on the early Middle Ages. And also, it's nice to do so at a point where I'm just going on uh, annual leave for Easter after a very busy term and after having been involved in uh, industrial action for my union, trying to fight for a uh, against uh, our overall pay being cut and uh, all sorts of other uh, workload issues. Um, so it's a nice moment. I'm, I'm on here, obviously I'm on YouTube, um, where I have um, a, a, an Archeo Death YouTube channel, which you can check out. And my, it all stemmed from my WordPress blog, which has been going since 2013. And you can see there's over 1,600 blog posts on various things about archaeology, heritage, linked to death and memory. So that's all the backdrop. Um, and do you know what? Um, I've, I'm just watching The Last Kingdom season five. Has anyone else been watching that? And I've just watched the funeral of Sieg Trigger um, in a boat burial. And what was really interesting, just comparing that uh, modern TV representation of a funeral with uh, Beowulf's funeral, is, of course, the fact that a Beowulf, um, you know, 10 days of ceremony to build a mound, 
whereas in the TV show, um, they give four, four, uh, three lads and four wheelbarrows to try and uh, build the burial mound for Sig Trigger, which we <laughs> so I, I find that rather amusing. The how the TV people don't really get the fact that these burial mounds would have been major pieces of work. Um, yeah, so that's I've got things I can talk about, but um, I'm always willing to take questions. In answer to the question by apostrophe, I will say immediately that. Um, um, yes, uh, Beowulf versus Achilles, difficult to know. I would say Beowulf. You know why? Because Beowulf has iron. Achilles have just been poxing around with bronze. And, you know, basically, Bronze Age warrior, Iron Age warrior. I think, it's, it's, you know, and, and, you know, Beowulf didn't even need weapons. He could rip people's heads off, you know, with the bare hands. That's how he killed his first enemy, Grendel, in the poem. So I think Achilles is toast, really. He would last about two minutes and his ankles would be broken. <laughs> that's my personal that's my personal take. Uh, good question, you know, not one I'd thought of before, you know, but if you want a semi-serious answer, that's uh, that's that's as good as any. And I'm and I celebrate that with a, a bit of mead, um, which I got from the Lancashire Mead Company. So I'm gonna celebrate with a bit of mead. Mm. But um he was also almost immortal, but so was Grendel. Remember, no no weapon could harm Grendel or Grendel's mother, and Beowulf still managed to kill them through the strength of his his um his sheer physical strength. He ripped off Grendel's arm and he bled out. And uh, you can be as immortal as you like, but if you've got no blood pumping around your body, you're kind of dead. So <laughs> this is the thing about immortal people. I always wonder is that um, not that I go into gruesome detail with these things, but one can imagine you can be live forever, but you're not going to get very far with one arm with, you know, without any medical surgery. So Grendel, Grendel was toast. And then, um, yeah, you use an ancient weapon to kill Grendel's mum. Ah, so, you know, it always helps to have um, these things. Not the ankles. <laughs> Hello. Yes, nice to see you. Um, so yeah, I, I, went, I introduced by just reading out some of the Tolkien translation of Beowulf because I did want to talk to you about a little bit about treasure, um, early medieval treasure, because that's on my mind at the moment a lot because I'm actually doing a book, editing a book called The Public Archaeology of Treasure, which looks at how you know so much of our understanding of the past and the media coverage, uh, museum collections, uh, video game prizes, every video game is acquiring treasure, isn't it? You know, no matter how much we berate as archaeologists, oh, treasure, we don't want, we don't look for treasure. We're interested in information context. We want to tell about past societies. The treasure is, is immaterial. Yet, you know, the House of Lords was debating yesterday objects uh, um, plundered from, um, from East Africa by a British punitive expedition in the late 19th centuries and still not returned. Sacred artifacts of the Ethiopian church uh, that are still haven't been returned. You know, you know treasure, sacred treasures, you know, other kinds of loot, these things are still contentious uh, in our subject. They're really uh, focuses of debate. And it's, it's often the way people engage with them. It, we come across archaeology through treasure, whether it's from fictional context, you know, Tomb Raider, uh, Indiana Jones, or it's from actual um, stories like Beowulf. You know, the, the heroes fighting against supernatural beings, in this case a dragon, to acquire treasure from an ancient tomb. Now, basically, Beowulf is the ancestor of Indiana Jones. He's doing the same thing. He's sort of overcoming a difficulty to acquire stuff being guarded by ancient forces and dangerous beings. So Indiana Jones, Beowulf, who would win in that fight? Beowulf again, I'm afraid. Sorry, Indy. Love you to pieces in so many ways as a fictional character, but you wouldn't stand long against Beowulf either. Um, <laughs> but my, anyway, that's, that's aside the point. You know, I think treasure is such so important for public engagement. And yet, of course, it's a cursed term. It's a, it's a term that focuses on monetary value, on, on exclusive, you know, <laughs> oh yeah, the indie hand, all right, okay, right, let's give it to Indy on that, <laughs> that one, you know, with the guy with the, the scimitar and then Indy just pulls out the gun. Okay, well, let's give it to Indy then. Beowulf would be, would be, would be shot <laughs> um, or whipped. Ugh. Anyway, um, but my, my point would be that, uh, you know, so much of our public engagement from museums and the media uh, is, is about treasure and, you know, but it's a curse term. So um, the book I'm doing is involves students, involves other experts, and we're trying to talk about the legal issues, the problems of looting, the problems of illicit trade and antiquities, but also the many potentials of talking, using the term treasure to engage audiences. Um, and, and, it's, and, 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 and as E. Flowers says, yeah, I think it's the mystery and the puzzles that fascinate people in archaeology more than the objects. But 
often they go hand in hand, don't they? Like, they, you know, what was this object? What was it originally? How was it originally used? And how it was originally, um, you know, it, its context of use. And I, I think to say that everyone's only interested in shiny things <laughs> is, is, a, is, is, is right. It's right to, you know, question that. A lot of people want the story. They want to learn about past people, humble people, not just kings and, 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 and events. They want to understand social context. They want to understand how society's changed and developed over the long term. So, and I think those puzzles, those mysteries, those stories we can explore are the one way we can get make treasure interesting rather than an end in itself. But so often we come up against the fact that it's just sitting there, objects in a collection, in a display case, or in a in a magazine, or in a on a, on an internet, you know, a, a news story. You know, somebody finds objects and they're shiny, and that really takes over, doesn't it? It takes over the narrative. So I I think that's a really important point of how, you know, it can be almost the the eye catcher, the clickbait can be the treasure. But then people want to stay with archaeology because they want the stories. They, they want to find out about it. And that's very much the, the one about the most famous piece of early medieval treasure that um, I want to talk to you about a little bit is uh, Mound One at Sutton Hoo. And uh, it's not, not available digitally. This is volume one of the Sutton Hoo Ship Burial Excavation Report. And this was a famously... Uh, appeared in the Netflix film The Dig recently, if you saw that, or you, it's on Netflix, so go check it out if you have access to Netflix. Um, a sort of a fictional version of the discovery in 1939 in Suffolk in uh, South East England, well, in East England, um, of this unique, well-preserved chamber within a 27 metre long ship that was excavated first by an amateur archaeologist, Basil Brown, and then by a team of then leading experts just on the brink of the Second World War. And, and it was a unique survival. It still remains the wealthiest burial found in English soil. And its story is, is really, there's, there's always two stories. The story of discovery that led up, it took over 40 years, 40, 45 years for the first excavation report to appear. This was 1974, I think. Let me just double check. And this is the first of a number, 1975, sorry, 1975. So... I was but three years old when this first came out, but the actual the grave was dug in 1939. And um, subsequent excavations through the 60s and 70s, the 80s and 90s on the site. You can actually download this from Professor Martin Carver's website, but this is the most latest report on from the of, of synthesis of the princely burial ground. This is from 2005. There's been so much academic research on these objects. You can go and see them in the British Museum. You can go to the National Trust Visitor Site in... in uh, in Suffolk, it's a national trust site. You can go and see the burial mounds that survive, and there's a there's a museum and a cafe, and a, you know you can learn about these this amazing archaeological site that wasn't really understood at all and investigated before 1938, where Basil Brown excavated two mounds, um, subsequently called mounds, uh, three three mounds, sorry, mounds two, three, and four, and then he, he went back in 1939 and excavated what became known as Mound One, um, the the biggest mound, which contact covered this ship burial and you know the, the 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 thing i'm writing about and i've just published about is this we still call it in the british museum we still call it treasure and beowulf translations of seamus heaney's uh seamus, seamus heaney's translation of beowulf is is in the british museum you know calling it treasure using the the beowulf poem to define the the archaeological finds as treasure and yet of course the Sutton Hoo treasure, these amazing objects, the helmet, the purse mount, the, the, uh, the, the uh, shoulder clasps, all these gold and garnet objects, the, the, the drinking horns, the cauldron, the, the hanging bowls, these 250 plus, I think, if I remember rightly, objects found in this burial chamber with a unquestionably a high status person was buried there. People do claim it with more surety than we have, that it was King Raedwald of East Anglia who was buried in Mound One at Sutton Hill. But whoever was buried there, clearly a wealthy, you know, the highest status of burial, whether a king or a prince, you know, the type of, from the age of Beowulf was written about. That's the thing, the connection to Beowulf. And so often, um, so often, um, the, these finds have been called treasure. And there never were. There were grave goods placed in a funeral and this leads to the questions about well, why are we using this term treasure 
for something that in 1939 a coroner's inquest ne- declared was not treasure and could be given to the it could be could be kept by the landowner who then donated it to the British Museum. But then ever since we've called it treasure. Um, and I think it's to do with British Museum and ownership and apostrophes made the point here, which I was getting to actually. I I'll, I'll just want to be a bit of prelim before I get to that point. But um, is that tre- the treasure was never probably this, this assemblage of objects in the seventh century, early seventh century, probably gathered on the death of a king from across the land different rulers, allies, you know, um, family members brought objects to honour the dead person, including feasting gear, war gear, you know, uh, armour, uh, helmet, shield, spears, sword, axe hammer, um, you know, and uh, ceremonial objects too. All these objects were gathered together and placed in this chamber within a ship, and then covered over. This would have been a huge amount of work, massive performance. And um, to call it treasure kind of denigrates it. These objects had meanings, they had stories with them. They, they meant something we don't even know exactly. Some of them were quite old, but the helmet is probably at least 50, 60 years old when buried. Um, so you have things like that. The, the, these objects, the silver coming from Byzantium, coming from the Eastern Mediterranean, was probably about 50, 60, 70 years old when buried. So these, these were prized objects. They weren't just pretty stuff that had a monetary value. These objects that defined an identity, an identity of the dead person and of their kin. And to call it treasure is a bit demeaning. It's the same with the Tutankhamun's treasure. You know, it's, it's, these, are, these are funerary offerings. These are objects that bound the living and the dead in a story. So I have my, what I'm writing about at the moment is actually about how this term treasure is useful as a shorthand. It is, captures the imagination. But it's bound up with a very colonial, a very um, commodified attitude to art and antiquities, which takes us to the point of the rest of the stuff in the British Museum and other museums is, you know, do we, how is our language, how is the way we talk about these objects, how is the way we think about these objects that may have been, you know, thinking about all the stuff in any museum, not just the British Museum, any British, any museum worldwide, the stuff that's been acquired in from purchase, from acquisition through excavations and through plunder, you know, how do we, what do we do with these objects when actually the very way we describe them, the very terms we use about them, almost render them as just loot. It helps us to think of them as, as just pillaged objects. And so apostrophes asked me the very challenging question of what's your view on the British Museum's returning exhibits to their country of origin? I think a lot of um, people have for a very, very long time argued that some of those objects have no place in a British museum, not because they're not British. And I don't believe in reducing collections to being only from the regions in which they are, the most museums present. The British Museum was set up in the 18th century and was intended to be a global museum, not just a museum of Britain but a museum of a much broader human story. And that story can still be told in the 21st century. But does it need to be told with objects that were found and acquired in such such contentious ways? And in in a context in which um, it's not as if they weren't ignorant of that. They were acutely aware of the, the context in which those objects are being acquired. So it's not as if, oh, you know, only people today worry about these things. We suddenly found a conscience in 1978 or 80, 1994. We suddenly realised that this stuff, you know, no. We, there's never been a time when this stuff hasn't been seen for what it is as part of the acquisition to celebrate the British Empire, British superiority, British imperialism. And and, and so, so, yeah, this, so my view is that... Uh, while you can make the argument of a case by case basis, I think the the onus is on the archaeological museum world to really ramp, ramp up uh, restitution and repatriation of a host of antiquities. And and one of the things that really is interesting about this is a lot of the you know the thing the Sutton Hoo treasure. Um, I don't know if you. Um, you know about these objects and what they look like. I don't know if I can easily, um, let me just get, a, I'll find an image for you to give you a, a sense. This, 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 this excavation, which took place in 1939, the objects were taken to the British Museum and were immediately put into storage in an underground station 
that was used by the British Museum. And so it spent most of the war, these newly excavated objects from Mound One, spent most of the war sitting next to the Elgin marbles, trying to escape German bombing. So not only are these objects from a Suffolk field tied up with our ideas of treasure, but they are actually physically within months of their discovery, they're literally rubbing shoulders, if you can rub shoulders of objects, with some of the, the most famous controversial objects that are still in the, the museum's possession, you know, the, the path and the marbles, the, the Elgin marbles, as they previously know, but which there's been a long debate about their return to Greece. So my view is actually um, there's no case to, there's no case to there's no justifiable case for the status quo. Absolutely no. Nobody nobody who knows anything about the situation can can claim that things should stay the way they are. On the other hand, though, um, it really does depend on which collections where and who's actually claiming them. And, and in some cases it's really straightforward. Um, in other cases it's much more complicated <laughs> where these objects go. And, but then it also applies to Britain. And, and it also, like many of the Scottish finds, Scottish antiquities in the National Museum of, uh, in, in Edinburgh, National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, a lot of local communities around Scotland really resent that those objects are in, in Edinburgh. Objects are from Dumfries and Galloway in the southwest of Scotland. Objects from Orkney and Shetland. Why are they in Edinburgh? And the same goes for the British Museum. This, some of Wales's best objects are in the British Museum. And there's an arg argument being made about whether they should go to Cardiff, whether they should go to Wrexham Museum, you know, depending on where they're from. So it's not just about colonial restitution to other parts of the world. There's also a question about should the British Museum contain many of the things from the regions of England, let alone Wales, Scotland, that, that, that could really be restored, such as the Lewis Chessman, the famous Viking Lewis Chessman, or uh, late, late Norse Lewis Chessman, that found on the Isle of Lewis, these Greenland walrus carved ivory figures. Um, and uh, they're actually, some of them are in the National Museum of Scotland. They're, they're actually, there's a mess of, there's a long story there about how they were broken up, but a lot of them are on display in the British Museum. And one could say, well, why the heck are they in the British Museum? And one of them, we say, well, of course, they're a national museum, they've got the expertise, the curatorial staff, they've got the, and, and so on. Um, another level, you could say, well, does everything have to be in blimmin' London? <laughs> so it's not just about Greece and Mexico and, uh, you know, Nigeria or Ghana or the, the, these kind of, you know, international restitution issues. There's also issues of, 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 of um, within the UK. And the final thing I'll say about that is that, to be fair to the British Museum, they've put a lot of effort into loaning out objects and 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 sharing on long-term loans with regions. So to, to, I think a lot of people characterise the British Museum as literally hoarding these objects. Well, actually, there has been a long tradition of sharing and, and temporary exhibitions around the world and across the country to, to address this issue. But I think this debate is, is, is there's no... There's no point in suggesting um, we can't we can't just pretend this isn't happening. We can't just ignore the debate. I suppose is is, is my is is my point. Um, um, you can't you can't just you can't just uh, pretend it's going to go away. Yes, and calling the, the naming so naming things treasure, naming things Elgin marbles, all of these terms are not. And people say to me on TikTok a lot, "Oh, you're just arguing about semantics." Well. The terms we use define the very context in which we're talking about things. And I'm happy to defend the use of the term treasure in some for some objects and some collections, because that's what the traditional term it's been used. But we've got to be, we can't pretend those terms don't have baggage. And if we're calling this wonderful Sutton Hoo burial, the wealthiest burial from British soil, we call it treasure. I think that, and it's a bit, a bit unfair of us as experts to call it that and then expect the public to treat it as something else to treat it for what it is, the stories behind those objects, of, like, like the poem Beowulf, how they were buried, how the, the, the performances in which these objects had meaning. They weren't just, stick another random rich thing in the grave there and then that'll be all, we'll just sod off to the, the, the hall to get rat assed on mead, which may have happened. But I think, it, you know, I think there was a lot more care and attention to which objects, how and why they were placed. So calling them treasure, I think is really denigrating. So thank you for those questions on that point. Um, so we've covered already who would win in a battle between Indy, Achilles and Beowulf. And I think we've sorted the, 
put the world to rights on that issue. And I think that is now, because it's been said on TikTok, this is now definitive, right? There's no debate. No, this is definitive. We now know who would win in those fights. You can't go back on that. I'm a professor of archaeology. Beowulf would win over Achilles. Indiana Jones would shoot Beowulf. End of story. Technology wins over anything else. Iron Age beats Bronze Age, but Modern Age beats Iron Age or Early Medieval. Okay. Sad, sad but true. Okay. So that's it. That's defined. We've dealt, we've dealt with the British Museum. We've sorted that out. We're going to return everything as much as possible within reason. We're going to stop calling things treasure when they're not treasure. Have I got any updates on the strike? Thanks, Mermaid JC. Lovely to see you here. And thank you for the congratulations on the 15,000, up to almost 15,500, almost, which is wonderful to have a bigger audience. And you've been really supporting me. So I really appreciate all of your, your help and, and attention um, um, to, to, you know, be getting there. But about the strike, yeah, we've been on strike. And, you know, I've had a, I've just done a couple of videos about altercations with angry men while on the picket line, because, um, a lot of people, it's really, it's really amazing to me how people don't understand what a strike is and what we're trying to do. I mean, this is really a last resort for anybody to go on strike. And we see strikes across the, across the, across the world for different reasons. You know, people make jokes, like, oh yeah, the postal strike, and, oh, bus drive, or, you know, lorry drivers in France are again on strike, aren't they always, you know, and things like this. But, you know, academics and professionals, we're not really, people say, oh, left-wing academics, always whinging about something, but we're not really going on strike unless we have to. And the problem is, we're striking because our university management won't even talk with the unions. And then and they're, they're trying to slash pensions. They're trying to they're, they're we're seeing. Well, everyone's facing a massive crisis with energy bills and with with everything, aren't we? I mean, we're all in the same boat. But, you know, we've seen my, my, my salary has basically been, been reduced over a decade by about a, a quarter. So I'm earning less, even though I supposedly on a, you know, um, a senior academic I'm, I'm i'm on a lot less money but it's it's really why i'm striking is for my junior colleagues it's my junior colleagues and get, trying to get into academia now i mean it has never been easy but now it's worse than ever in terms of competition lack of security um you know the the casualization and contracts and a lot of minority groups and disability groups are just not able to get in the door um and it's still a very white male well not white male and female but very white profession in the UK, it's it's and it's not through you know active. I don't think there's much active discrimination, but it's more about just a passive lack of movement on those issues. So uh, we're trying to fight on all those issues and try and get our managers to engage, and it's really hard work. So we're it's very demoralising because literally I've I've taken three weeks of uh, basically unpaid. You know, basically I'm striking. You lose your pay. They dock your pay, right? So I've, I'm struggling financially but you know i feel it's such an important time but we're not if, it's not as if we're trying to strike over like minute negotiation differences we're, we're trying to strike over getting the managers the the, the university sector managers the, the the vice chancellors to actually negotiate they were refusing and it's hardly surprising they're refusing given the arrogant climate we have in the uk of government and business who are just sacking people on the spot you know, who are, you know, um, P&O Ferries is the latest horror story, you know, but, you know, it, it's so, I'm afraid I don't have much hope, but I've got mead, you know, and that's, that's getting me going with the whole thing. So, Momo, Josie, i just seen your comments on the British Museum, but I agree, I'm catching up with my messages now. Angry Van Man, yeah, yeah. I have quite a few angry van man um, interactions. And I, I, I seem to be the one who, sort of, I don't know, everyone else seems, it's not, I don't know, something about me, but I, I was the person on multiple occasions who's been the person who sort of ends up having the interaction with these individuals. And um, yeah. <laughs> and we have a problem. Yeah, we have a problem with the strike that students, the, 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 the universities say, oh, look, you're damaging students' education. I said, well, look, we've just saved you through two years of pandemic, working our asses off from home in different conditions and circumstances. We've saved the university sector. You could at least pay us the same bloody money that you, you did beforehand, rather than ratcheting up the work even more and uh, not, not even having talking with us. So yeah, it is bad for the students, but equally, most of the students understand why we're doing it. And they, they see the work we've done for them through two years of pandemic 
you know, where we didn't have, you know, yeah, all right, you, you think higher education is not as essential as maybe nursing or, um, you know, primary school teachers. Sure. But, you know, at the end of the day, these are a, a generation of students, two years of university, generation, that's, that's, that's a really big cohort of thousands upon tens of thousands of students who have gone, have got, had to get their degrees through a pandemic. They've had a miserable time. And they, 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 their fees are going supposedly on our salary, and they're not. They're going to these managers who aren't giving us the money. So you know, I think the students, most of the students, understand why we're doing what we're doing, or why we've been striking. And uh, despite the negative impact um, that is perceived, um, it, it, you know, go on strike looks, oh, you know, just causing trouble, you know, disrupting. But you know, we wouldn't do it if if they were treating us, if they weren't treating us like poo on their shoe we we wouldn't be doing it and that's the thing you know um it's difficult isn't it oh thank you non-crazy crazy cat lady for the 15k thank you (laughs) yeah it's 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 sticking out some of my colleagues haven't been striking and that's really frustrating some of them are in the union but have been noticeable in their absence not only on the picket lines, but literally have been doing their work. And that is frustrating and undermines the cause. But, you know, you can't really enforce these things other than shouting abuse at them when I next see them, which I won't because I'm too nice. <laughs> I didn't realise the strike was the same one for three weeks. No, no, it's it, it's um. there's been two weeks uh, back to back of strikes. But they, they broke the university sector into two sections. So you have um, you have basically um, you have basically um, a a sort of um, they, had, they they said five days at one set of universities, five days at another. So we've been striking this week, and another lot of universities were striking the previous week, um, and but we were striking last month as well, you know. So we had and then striking in December. So it was December for three days, five days in um, February, and then five days in March. <laughs> yeah, so it's been it's it's been going on for quite quite a bit of quite a bit of time trying to keep this this thing going, and of course it affects because um I, I mean I I don't know everybody's different, but I don't, I've talked to a few of my colleagues and striking is not time off. I've been absolutely stressed about this. You know, I've been going on pickets for only a couple of hours a day, but then you you come back and you can't do anything. You can't do anything constructive. I've been you know doing a few jobs around the house and you know doing TikToks. I've got a backlog of about thirty five videos recorded to spew out at various points but it's very difficult to to be you know constructive and you feel stressed because you don't know whether even though rationally you know well the union have got your back they can't dismiss us for striking you don't feel relaxed about it because you think well how are they gonna how are they gonna use this against you in some ways so you do feel a bit uh yeah and we do try to we do try our best to make sure we don't you know we give the students support so before the strike i was you know, giving students support about what to do and how to go. <sighs> yeah, yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult with, but I mean, I had I had colleagues that, you know, were just never showing up for these things and not even supporting it. And it's really tough. It's really tough. Um, but we're trying our best. So the strike has been ongoing. I've been, I've been, I've been, you know, I've been doing this piece of work about treasure and Sutton Who. So that's actually written now, but I need to write the introduction to the book. And introductions are the bloody worst thing of writing academic work. I've written so many introductions to books. I've, I'm on my, I can't remember what number of books I've edited, but I've done one monograph and I'm on about 10 edited books, I think. And every introduction, I think, oh, I'm going to nail this. This will be easy. Just go, this book is a fascinating expression. Chapter, you know, and you just think, oh, no, I can't, I don't know what to say. Because you know the weight of, it's like opening a, you know, being compare at a, an event, public event. You feel, the weight is on those words. You've got to get it right from the start. So I took to spent ages trying to write this. So uh, he, uh, I, 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 I've got this. I've got two thirds of the introduction done, but I just need to get the introduction right. So I'm going to use. Um, I think I'm going to use the Detectorist TV show as my introduction and a few quotes from uh, Mackenzie Crook and uh, um, Toby. Um, what's his face? Uh, who are the actors in that? And use that as a way of introducing this idea of public treasure. But I haven't quite. I haven't had a day just to sit down and write this. So, um, but in my annual leave, which I'm on now, <laughs> this is the this is the mugs archaeologists are. You go on annual leave, I'll probably end up working on this introduction for a book, which is supposed to be my my job. So, 
yeah, <laughs> but I'd rather get the book out and done with and uh, rather than have it hang around anymore. But that's, that's the other thing I'm up to at the moment, yeah. So apart from the strike, reaching five, 15,000, telling you a bit about treasure um, and also, you know, um, yeah, drinking mead. Um, was it, was it, oh, yeah, I'm telling you about Siegfried and The Last Kingdom. Oh, my word. I've got three more episodes of The Last Kingdom Season 5 to watch. I, I, I can't face it. I've just got to try and get through it. I just can't. I'll write a blog post about it and tell you all the archaeology behind it. But I, I, I'm not enjoying it. I don't enjoy it. It's the accents and the constant wailing. The constant wailing. <laughs> it's maybe nice music for some, but it's just for me, it's like um, it's like having a drill into my side of my head. You know, it's just uh, it's just repetitive. It's just repetitive. It's not the music. It's just it's so repetitive. Um, but anyway, let me see if there's any more questions rather than me babbling on. Commission an archaeologist. I like the sound of that. You sound like you're up to stuff. Commissioning. Oh, construction project. Oh, right. Well, oh, well, hurrah. Hurrah for that. I hope they do a good job. And if not, um, you know, tell me about it. <laughs> no, no, it was just interesting. Oh, that's good. I hope that goes well. Do you know, I don't play any video games. It's one of those. I used to. The last time I played video games was when I did my master's thesis back in the day. Back in the day. The day being uh, 1995. And I just realised that I've got an addict. I, I would be, I'd literally be spending all my life on video games if I started a video game. So I've seen like screen captures and I've watched a few YouTube videos of some of the historically based video games, a bit of God of War, just to get a sense of what people are talking about. So I know roughly what Assassin's Creed Valhalla looks like. But playing it, no, if I did that, I would, I would never get any work done. I'm, I've got the, I don't know, I, is it an addictive personality or addict? I am addicted to those kind of things. So I've, I've decided, no, my life can do without video games. I, uh, but I, I, you know, I have not through dislike, but just through, I know that it'll be, I'll be, t I'll like it too much. So to speak, I won't do anything else. <laughs> oh, Cornish Cobb Barn. All right. That sounds cool. I've had students who've done presentations about Skyrim in my 2020 book, uh, I had uh, a, um, a piece by one of my students published uh, looking at video games and Vikings and saying how actually, you know, it is his, his take was despite the many inaccuracies, which is my take really as well, because it was almost like I taught him and he agrees with me. But the point is, he's making the point that, um, you know, despite the inaccuracies, which I bitch about on TikToks, actually these video games are a massive boon for archaeology, showing immersive experiences of, you know, particular eras, no matter how crazy and historically inaccurate they are, they get people engaged with that immersive world building, that, you know, that, that kind of exploration within a world. And so in that regard, I think video games are something I, I can't help but, you know, yeah, Elder, Elder Ring, yeah, yeah, these, these, I've heard about these things, but I haven't actually looked at all of them. And there's that other, there's about four, there's about so many Viking ones. I mean, you know, I love the Vikings, but equally I hate them because there's so many other early medieval peoples and societies that are interesting too. But, you know, they're the way in, aren't they? Everyone everyone does gets into Viking stuff and that's fine. But um, and I don't know if I am neurodiverse, actually, Mermaid Jealousy. I can't use that as an excuse. I, I don't think I'm just, I don't, but maybe I am. I, who knows? Maybe, maybe I, I've never been diagnosed with anything apart from people diagnosing me for being an arsehole, which is probably just personality defects, but I, rather than just finding anything neurodiverse in me. But no, I, I think, um, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I, I, I've never, but maybe it is. I, I mean, archaeology does hyper-focus and archaeology artefact analysis and, uh, you know, paleo-environmental specialists and lab-based work and excavation-based work. You can see why certain people go into these things and maybe part of the mix is neuro neurodiversity. I, I, I haven't really been you know, diagnosed myself in that regard, but maybe, who knows? Yeah, um, you could do, I could do a whole series. I mean, I know I have a friend, Archeosuit plays a video games and um, and he, you should check out his YouTube channel. He does actually play video games and 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 then um, you know, discusses the archeology. span Also, um, what's his name? Adrian Reinhardt does, has done a book on archeo gaming, which sort of sets out the whole field of researching archeo gaming. And there's that, Wonderful um, person I follow on here who does our Pokemon archaeology uh, um, series of uh, TikToks. There's lots of people into this, and there's other other academics who've written about 
video games and archaeology. And one of my students did a piece on uh, Afnan Ezeldin. She did a piece on video gaming and archaeology. And I think it's a really rich field of, of discussion. I just know that if I start, um, uh, JC, uh, Archeo Soup. If you YouTube Archeo Soup, you'll find him. He's on TikTok as well. He's a lovely chap. Mark Bartman Astles. He's a lovely chap. He does some really good stuff. I did a video recommending him uh, about seven, eight videos back, and he's really good. Um, but, you know, yeah, video games and archaeology is something I, I respect. I understand why it's an important field of investigation. Some people mock it and say, oh, you know, video games, it's just superficial public entertainment. But this is the way people are accessing, you know, the human past, even in a fictional environment. And I think it's really important people people discuss it. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, topics of panels and big conferences these days. Yes, it's, it's a big field. Yeah, Archeo Soup, as in Archeo in the English spelling, A-R-C-H-A-E-O Soup. Yeah. But yeah, it's a big, it's a big theme. Uh, um, but then so much, you know, um, there's some really great um, voices in archaeology who are, you know, taking this kind of format seriously of, you know, um, Navajo Rocks, uh, Podhead's just mentioned, brilliant content. He's just down to earth. He does sort of like micro lectures. I've I tried to I've tried to not do too much of that, and I, I think we're all trying to we're all trying to negotiate negotiate these apps in different ways, aren't we? Trying to communicate. I haven't done sort of many straight up lectures, but no, I have I've done a few. Um, but I suppose my point is, what I've deliberately not done as an archae a mortuary archaeologist is follow the grifter clickbait. Let's do something about children dying in horrible ways, or let's do something about ancient torture. I've done a few tortury subjects, but mainly driven by that's what I'm researching or I have a knowledge of, but I haven't deliberately gone. Archaeologists have found a human head with a massive cut in it, caused by an axe or whatever it is. And it's like, I don't I think it's just bloody un distasteful, to be honest with you. I think it's just downright gross. And that's not why I'm I could easily pack TikTok with images of human remains and grisly burials and unusual freakish you know um you know skeletons and mummies and i think that I, yeah just just i think i'd have to just uh urinate away any integrity i had if i was going to do that i'd rather actually focus on you know s talking about things that i have some confidence in i could easily you know rather than just trying to present you know about yeah that's it that's it j eight two one's got it archaeo soup that's it yeah Yeah, I mean, you can learn that there's so many ways into archaeology, historical fiction, gaming. Um, historical fiction is great. I mean, like, I was just talking about The Last Kingdom, which all comes from Bernard Cornwall novels. I've read some of his Arthurian novels and they're OK. You know, they give you a, a way in. And I'm not snobby about it. And I've got a video coming up about this because some people are really snobby about, oh, well, you know, you're not getting the real past if you engage with it. Most people get into archaeo in early medieval archaeology by either reading Arthurian fiction or Lord of the Rings, you know? And some, you know, there's no, what's, what's the being snobby about it? That's the way we get into things as kids or as adults. We get into things. Why, why be snobby about that? And, and those things don't have to go away. We don't have to like, go, oh, that was a childish phase. And now I know that it's all wrong. <laughs> How embarrassing I was when I was here. No, fuck it. Now you stay with it. That's something that still inspires me. I remember meeting one really eminent archaeologist once about talking about Lord of the Rings. He said, ah, yeah can't watch that crap, just lots of orcs being killed. And I thought, but you know, mate, your whole career is an early medieval archaeologist predicated on this popular engagement with fictional versions of mythologies and legends adapted that originally stem from the early Middle Ages. So how can you have that attitude? But other people, I don't know, I see it as all ways in, a historical fiction. But you don't have to make it into some kind of parody of everything being about grim torture and, and misery. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Mermaid JC prefers narwhal teeth. Well, I think we all prefer narwhal teeth. <laughs> yeah, and it's a door in, as you say. And we're all built by narratives and yeah, what is real as opposed to, you know, we're, we're all living in the present. We can't go back. We haven't got time machines. I'm not Doctor Who, much as I'd like to be. Um, um, but, you know, we're all creating stories for the present. And while I'm not a total relativist, I'm not someone who thinks, yeah, it's all valid. Any story is valid. I, I think there's, there's, I'm still challenged, you know, bogus ideas. But 
if people want to engage with stories that they understand are fiction or a personal faith that also spills out into a broader interpretation, you don't have to become, I mean, like, you know, many medievalists are, have been traditionally Catholics. Many, it doesn't mean you have to be a Catholic to understand the Middle Ages or now Norse pagan is, you know, much, yeah. but it doesn't mean you have to abandon those faiths and beliefs to study it. In fact, these things, things can cross fertilize in really constructive ways. So I think, you know, I, I think as a, there's many a person who I know has got an infinite knowledge of things more than I do on a particular area of my field. That I'm supposed to be an expert in that, you know, and they've come come to come with it from come come at it from a, a non academic perspective, and they know everything about that particular topic. And so I'm, I try not to be too snoopy. <laughs> you did, are you deliberately triggering me about horrible histories because I mentioned no maybe how who would who would know what I comment on a random post? But I was just admitting on a post only a couple of days ago how I've never really. Never really, never really liked horrible histories. Shh, don't tell them. Uh, I've never really liked them. I don't know. I, 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 but yeah, but it is. I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure it's good for those that like it. But I've never, I, it's my of my secret, secret things. I've never quite liked horrible histories. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. But it is, yeah, it's, it's mostly right. And then, you know, it, it's, it's, but it, 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 it jars with me. Oh, you didn't know. Okay, well, <laughs> sorry about that. That's my confession. <laughs> Okay, it's tea time. It's tea time. We love the tea. Oh, I, 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 I think your tea time. I'm on mead still, so you know you have to go and do what you tea. You have to go and do your. I know it's aimed at kids, and, and but and, you know I don't know. I think even as a kid, I thought it was a bit. Uh, you know, I wasn't. I didn't find it. Or maybe I was. Maybe I was never a kid when that horrible history was on. I remember the books coming out anyway. And I thought they were mildly okay. Yeah, I think that's the thing. The the, the disgust aspect, I mean, disgusting things and gross things are fun, um, but I mean, like that's the point, isn't it? Is if I was, I know this is everyone goes, oh, it's a kids app, but if I'm on here going, hey kids, do you want to see something really gross that happened in the past when people were smelly and they lived in their own poo and all this stuff? I, you know, I, come on, you know, I, I, that's that's all right at one level, but we're trying to be respectful of other cultures and civilizations, past and with with, you know. Descending communities, we can't do that kind of gross stuff and then pretend to be respectfully, you know, tackling um, Mesoamerican societies, Sub-Saharan African societies, ancient Southeast Asian societies, and you know, parts of Northern Europe. And and then and, you know, I think it, it, it's a, it's a difficult game to play, and it's okay to do it as entertainment. But I think if I did it, it would just come across as naff and lame and and contrived and played. And I don't want to do that, so I, I try to. <laughs> oh sorry right i misunderstood you there mmajc about gossip and tea i think the voyeurism aspect is 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 a problem i mean i'm certainly grateful to be living in the 21st century despite the the likely impeding third world war and, uh, and global energy crisis and all these things. At least I'm, gl I'm glad that, you know, until the zombie apocalypse hits, I'm, I'm, I'm saying I like to have flushing toilets. I like to be able to have uh, clean water. And there's so many benefits of having a national health service. Those of us that still have one and uh, just about, and um, you know, I don't want to go back to live in the Roman period. I don't want to live in the Viking age. You know, they can, they can stick it. You know, I don't no, I'm never going back. Um, but equally, I, I, so I think there's an idea of like, like people criticise tourists to going to a developing world and you know doing that one week of voluntary work and putting your arm around a kid and getting a photo taken going yeah oh, I was really rich by the experience that celebrity type thing you know but people heavily criticise but isn't isn't there a version of that with the past that we we have the we, we risk doing the same thing with past societies that kind of mocking and derogatory characterisation I I don't I don't know. It's a difficult one. We've just got to be aware of it, haven't we? Just be aware of not, not to be a complete dickhead when dealing with ancient societies. They may not have descendant communities, but you don't have to be a complete, you know, voyeur, voyeur when dealing with them and, and quite so, you know, patronising about past people. <laughs> Fish news farts. No, that's, that's true. Okay. I can't, who can argue with a fish fart?
TARDIS. Apostrophe asked me, if I had a TARDIS for just one trip, where would you go? Well, you know the answer, don't you? Well, I'd probably go back. Probably go back to a key moment. Uh, one, ver one journey, I suppose. Go back and tell myself not to become an archaeologist. <laughs> the younger Howard. And I say, don't do it! Don't do it! Do not seek the treasure! You know, as in, uh, oh brother, where art thou? Um, yeah, warm myself off this career. No, I, I, I don't know. I know. But the problem is, the, that's the whole problem. Actually, I, I don't think I'd go anywhere. I'd probably send it back. Um, it would auto, auto send it back. So I didn't have to. Um, because I don't want to go back and see one snapshot. I mean, I see a funeral. It'd be good to see a 6th century, early 7th century princely burial like Sutton Hoo. See what actually happened. That would be really fun. So yeah, maybe maybe Sutton Hoo in AD 625 or thereabouts. How precise we are with the dating depends on where we'd go. But you know, I'd go back one trip, spend a year or two banging around East Anglia, see what the heck they were doing with the, in the funerals. That would be a laugh. That's a good question. Thank you. I like the idea of that. But no, most likely I'd probably just go back to warn my younger self not to, be, not to embark on a career <laughs> in our yeah, and of course the thing is, we could easily go. We could easily go. Um, it could easily go wrong if you go back in time. And some, hello, I'm from the twenty first century. Kill him! You know, I'd kill me. I tell you. <laughs> yes, yes, brother. Yes, early medieval Wales. Go and see how the Pillar of Elisek looked when it was first constructed. That's the monument I excavated. So yeah, I would go back then. I'd probably go back then. Yes. But I have to, I'd have to disguise myself as a ghostly Howard visiting my younger self to uh, warn myself off. Like Doc in Back to the Future. You know, I have to just sort of walk backwards towards myself and go, Don't do it! <laughs> Marty! <laughs> Random celebratory 15k chat. Been lovely. Thank you very much. But, um, <laughs> yes, this is my glass claw beaker, Grey Viking. Hello, Grey Viking. Yes, this is my 6th six, six century rep oh, reproduction, obviously. I don't just have archaeological objects banging around the house. By definition, that's the last thing I'd have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dinda Gunda. <laughs> I will I think I will push off if that's all right. Uh, and uh, but I will I'm gonna I'm gonna more videos coming folks. I've got videos on the Mandalorian. I've got videos on uh, is it okay to have people of colour represented in TV shows on Vikings? That'll piss off some people. But that'll be interesting. I've got videos on all sorts of things that will cause outrage and controversy. No, I mean, it's just stuff that everyone knows, but um, hopefully it'll be good. But uh, but uh, keep keep watching. Thanks for all your support. And uh, I'll see you soon, all of you, in, in some digital environment near you. <laughs> Thanks again. Take care. Bye now. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Howard Williams on YouTube. In addition, consider following of the Archeodeath WordPress blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.